Welcome to the closing plenary session. Um, my name is David Chikvaidze. I work for the United Nations, and I have the daunting task of moderating this uh, uh, closing plenary, the closing plenary of uh, an incredibly rich five days, uh, which saw uh, many, many uh, terrific ideas, visions, uh, proposals uh, come out from an absolute uh, star lineup of, of speakers, of specialists. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, an absolutely uh, um, uh, very special lineup of speakers for the closing session. Uh, between them, they have so many titles that if I were to enumerate all of them, uh, we would probably need two sessions. So um, I will uh, selectively uh, say a few things about each uh, as I introduce them. Uh, you know, there has to be some uh, perk to being a moderator. So please uh, do not uh, feel uh, offended if I leave out something that is particularly uh, uh, warm to your hearts. Um, I would like to start with uh, uh, the Honorable Gabriela Cuevas Baron. She is the president, current president of the Interparliamentary Union, our neighbor right here in Geneva, and we work very closely together. She is a very well-known and prominent politician in her own country, Mexico. I use politician in the most positive of meanings. It does have lately different meanings in different countries, but she is really a shining example of, of what a civic-minded politician and a senator ought to be doing for her country and for the international community. And we're very, very happy that uh, she leads the um, uh, interaction and cooperation with the United Nations in general and with the United Nations office in Geneva uh, in particular. Gabriela, I am very pleased to hand the uh, mic over together with the screen to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all for this wonderful invitation. It is a huge honor to be with you with uh, such a fantastic group. So, so thank you very much for considering the Interparliamentary Union and considering the, the perspective of the politicians that are represented in the Parliament. And uh, of course, asking a politician to talk about uh, leadership, uh, I think it's not easy because it makes us remember our roots and also, of course, the important values and skills and causes and passions that we must have every day in our lives. I think that when we try to speak about the leadership in the 21st century, it's not easy because we need to start literally for seeing all the problems that a leader needs to fix. And the first part of it is, well, which are the values that a leader needs in this 21st century? And uh, again, starting from the beginning, we need to ask the politicians right now for having integrity. I think that the planet, I think the world is more than enough on uh, fake news, double standards. So we need uh, leaders with integrity. We also need leaders that believe and are truly committed with equality. When we are seeing all these movements of uh, Black Lives Matter, say, Me Too, all these speeches of terrible leaders that then we need to remind them that xenophobic is not okay. Being a misogynist is not okay. So we need people that understand that equality is a must, that we are the same humanity. The other very important issue I think is discipline. We need to work every single day and being a leader demands 24 seven of our time. So we really need to understand that being a leader, having a voice and having a commitment also needs important discipline. I think the other issue that it is not that common in the leaders and it's very much needed in the 21st century is remembering that every decision, every action 
must have the persons at the center. We need to understand that being a humanist means that every one of our actions is going to be dedicated to the people, in my case, that we represent, but also those people that are believing in us and they are uh, trusting that we are going to make a better planet. And of course, responsibility. I've been in politics for 26 years. And one of the things that I cannot uh, understand is how easy it is for some leaders to avoid responsibility from their words, their actions, or the consequences. So we need responsible leaders. We need people to understand that everything that you do when you have a leadership position is going to have consequences for good, for bad, or for the ugly. The second issue is that we need leaders with skills. And, uh, and by skills, I, I mean in a very comprehensive way. We need inspiration. We need people that are passionate about being a leader, that are committed with the, the, the uh, importance of this responsibility. We need honesty and transparency. We need inclusion. There are some leaders that believe that a, a pie must be for a single person. A true leader understands that collaborative efforts, that collaborative leadership is going to have better results. We also need, and that's something I think very clear in the 21st century, leaders with very important skills for communications. For those communications that are needed in the streets, but also those ones that now are in the social media and sometimes that are almost impossible to understand. If you ask me, well, trying to understand TikTok as a means for communication is, I, I feel clueless. But we need to understand that communications in the 21st century are going to evolve and change every day. And we need to be there if we want to deliver a message. Of course, and I, I think that it is going to be very clear for this auditorium is global vision. We need global leaders. Problems are not respecting borders. And some of the important voices in the planet are going precisely in the opposite sense. They are going into thinking that nationalism is the answer. And well, if we take a very brief read on the 20th century, well, the accented nationalism didn't they did well for humanity or for their own countries. And I think there's a very important skill that is highly underrated, which is empathy. Now, Apparently, it is only about making statements. But I think that what makes a leader is the possibility of understanding, the possibility of interacting, the possibility of being with other people and feel the same. Uh, I think, yes, you were talking about compassion. But I believe that empathy goes even in a, in a more uh, comprehensive way. We need to be able to we say in, in Mexico, and from Mexico, we, we say that you need to put into the other people's shoes. That's the only way to make no, not only empathy, but the foundations for, for understanding. The third part is, well, a leader in the 21st century needs tools. And tools, I think, well, there's like this kind of debate about technocrats and politicians. And I believe that we need a little bit of both. We need brains but we need hearts. We need thoughts, but we need passion. We need ideas and projects, but we need people to uh, be able to transmit the passion for these causes and to bring other people to the same project. We need, of course, training. I think that we should ask our leaders to have more a renaissanceist perspective. People who are able to learn about everything and with the generosity and wisdom to find the most, uh, uh, the smartest people to do the task. I think that's one of the, of the possibilities of the 21st century, to look for the, the people, not only in the closest community, but even globally. We need to understand, again, in tools, uh, media and communications. Yes, we have fake news, 
but we also have an opportunity to bring more people to the same causes. And of course, vision, planning, capacity for executing. I do believe also that the leaders of the 21st century need to understand that this is about a cause. This is about having passion for humanity, having passion for the planet, having passion for inclusion, for bringing women, youth, children, for bringing everyone to the same table to take decision and to change the world. The 21st century, well, it is, we can say just starting and it is getting really, really complicated. Not only 2020, but all this uh, beginning of the, of, the, of the 21st century has been so complicated. We can see that uh, it started with a climate crisis, with huge debate in terms of inequality, with problems in terms of sustaining peace. But now those kind of uh, continuous crises are now added to new and bigger crises. When we talk, for example, in a sanitary or the, the health crisis due to this pandemic, but also the, there's a lot of sicknesses regionally that we need to understand and fight and help those countries of course, we have an economic and financial crisis that it, uh, it's not new. The world has not been growing since the crisis in the year 2008. But we need to understand that an economic relief must be uh, always having people at the center and we need to understand that it has to be designed to fight inequalities. And of course, there are some other possible crises political crisis in those countries that inequality is growing, that the pandemic is not having a strong solutions. And we're going to have also during this century, a lot of technological changes. What are the leaders of the 21st century going to do with automation? How are we going to include youth when jobs are disappearing? How are we going to design an inclusive society with such disparities in access to technology. I believe that what we need to make a better 21st century is precisely that, is leadership, is inspiration, it's passion. It's about bringing the best values of humanity to the political arena and to understand that politicians are obliged not only to bring politicians to the table, but to make the politics, the parliaments in my case, of the 21st century. Those who are renewing a commitment with democracy, renewing their commitment with human rights, and renewing their commitment with equality. Thank you, thank you very much for this wonderful invitation, David. It is an honor of uh, being here with you, such important personalities. Thank you, and please count always on the IPU. Thank you so much, Gabriela. Thank you for an extraordinary, um, uh, charting of, of uh, the, uh, the parameters that it takes to be a, a good leader. And the way you describe the, uh, the job description of, of a good leader, I would love to see the uh, list of applicants and uh, would love to be on the panel interviewing them for that kind of a job. Thank you so much. Really uh, very, very uh, valuable addition. Our uh, next panelist and uh, next speaker is Dr. Ismail Serageldin. He serves as chair or member of a number of uh, advisory committees, boards, academic, research, scientific, and international institutions, um, notably as uh, co-chair together with um, uh, the former president of Latvia, Ms. Uh, Vike Vaira Freiberger, who uh, was uh, speaker at the opening session and, uh, and uh, extraordinary panelist in the um, uh, panel on multilateralism. Uh, they serve as co-chairs of the Nizami Ganjavi International Center in Baku. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you and uh, President Vicky Freiberger for the hospitality and uh, excellent uh, uh, sessions that you uh, extended to us uh, last year when we had the pleasure uh, together with a, a big uh, WAAS delegation to be part of uh, that uh, special um, 
a few days. Thank you. But uh, what uh, actually, uh, to me, as the former director of the League of Nations and UNOG Library, is most uh, sort of closest to my heart is that Dr. Seregeldin is the uh, the founder of the Alexandria, modern Alexandria library. Talk about historical libraries. And he is the, um, the honorary or the, uh, the, the librarian emeritus of the library and uh, uh, a chairman of the board of trustees of this library. So that is, uh, to me, <laughs> really chapeau because libraries, despite our age, continue to be uh, really the, uh, the um, institutions that capture, preserve, and uh, pass on knowledge. And it's not all on Google, I assure you, as a former librarian. Uh, Dr. Seregeldin, it's an honor to have you back on a, a panel or on this, in this case at the closing session. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege to be invited to share some thoughts with you at this closing session of what is really, truly a fascinating conference. We are meeting in the shadow of the greatest pandemic in a hundred years, in the midst of an unmatched recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s, and yet able to generate a movement of solidarity in all countries. Solidarity with those who demand equality and justice for the marginalized minorities in the United States, but elsewhere in the world as well. We have mobilized the marvels of contemporary technology to enable us uh, to meet in cyberspace and to allow us to look into each other's eyes as we discuss the most urgent issues of our time. It is like taking a magic carpet. All of a sudden I was in Boston with the American Academy and then I was here with you in Geneva and who knows where I'll be in a few hours. It is amazing what we have done there and yet we have left behind many of the same problems that we inherited still unsolved. It is good that we meet about these urgent issues of our time, for indeed these are challenging times. Under the threat of climate change, mourning the loss of our rich biodiversity, worried about the stability of the oceans and the seas, a pandemic has been loosed upon the earth and the entire human family is suffering. And the problem of public health has morphed into an economic challenge. And though all of humanity is arrayed against an alien common enemy, a virus, we still squabble among ourselves. We still kill each other. And so-called leaders look to where they can divert accusations rather than how we can seek to work together. And as we look, we see in fact that Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world and the blood dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And so it is with profound thanks that we salute the great project that the World Academy of Arts and Sciences has undertaken with the UN office in Geneva to recognize the need for a new type of leadership for the 21st century not merely the rearrangement of a few pieces on the vast global chessboard. We salute the organizers for having dared to dream of seizing the planetary moment. And in the pursuit of that dream, we have indeed strengthened the sinews of our thoughts and have unleashed the power of ideas. We have ranged far and wide. The conference, I believe, included over 40 sessions with some 200 speakers addressing solutions to pressing global problems related to all the set of issues that we have to look at, to pursue solutions with both passion and compassion. I will not try to summarize what everybody said, but I do see seven general themes that disengage from all these discussions. First, of course, is peace and security, whether it is to stop the killing or to reallocate military funds, it is essential. Then we have health, education, and well-being from the children to the elders. And we have governance and human rights and remembering that women's rights are human rights. 
and we talk about finance, economy, and employment, in an economic system that rejects these enormous inequalities and embraces the circular economy and true sustainability in its environmental, social, and ethical dimension. And in that perception, we must also bring in the civil society and youth. And yes, find the balance between energy, ecology, and climate. And finally, bring together science and technology to do all it can to serve humanity and the planet, and not just destruction and war. Seven keys for seven locks in the door to a better future. A future that would see the realization of the sustainable development goals as a transition to a new and better world. Not governed by a single hegemon, but managed by all as a collective enterprise where thought is free and action is bounded by ethics and ideals uh, are our beacons that chart the collective course. Now looking back at these many panels and the many profound insights that were expressed, we can wonder, did we indeed come up with a new type of leadership? Did we lay the foundation for a new kind of movement? I would say no, not yet, not yet. But we started on the quest that brought us here together. We started developing the vision and the ideas that we need to pursue. For those who doubt that we have advanced because our discussions have not yet produced a global master plan, or a global leadership that would be fit to rise to the challenges of the 21st century, I say, remember that we are, in Borstein's word, questers. We recognize that the value of our efforts at deep thought and profound reflection lies more in the fecundity of the questions rather than in the finality of the answers that we seek. We have, I submit, strengthen the sinews of our thoughts, confident that in the long run, it is the power of ideas that will triumph against the myopic pursuit of profit or the narrow persistence in asserting one group against the other in creating this new leadership for the 21st century that is so badly needed. But should this planetary moment not also be a moment where a younger generation steps forward to take the helm for the battles of the future? Yes, but I submit that youth is a state of mind. We must marry the energy, physical energy of youth to the wisdom of the experienced, the vitality and the intelligence of the young with the skills and insights of the young at heart. Yes, the young at heart. For I say, like many here, that Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up our ideals wrinkles the soul. The years may mark our face, diminish our physical rigor, whiten our hair, and limit our eyesight, but we can remain young at heart. And for you are as young as your faith, as old as your doubt, as young as your dreams, and as old as your cynicism, as young as your self-confidence, and as old as your fear as young as your hope and as old as your despair. And you will remain young as long as you believe in the beauty of your dreams, that you believe in hope, sheer and courage. And only if you give in to pessimism and lose your heart to cynicism, then and only then are you grown old. And then indeed, as Douglas MacArthur said, you just fade away. The purpose of this conference was to address the global leadership vacuum to confront or nay, to reverse reactionary trends that are rising in many forums, political currents that beget authoritarianism, attitudes that develop suspicion and hatred of the other simply because they are different, currents and attitudes that are eroding many of the democratic achievements that we have secured. And so we must direct global society towards a new paradigm in human development. And in this conference, we have started. And the aim is to incubate the ideas that will marry the compassion and caring of the ethical, recognize the innate human rights of each and every one to dignity and freedom, 
as we govern our societies with justice and cooperation, and as we mobilize science, mobilize science to feed the hungry, heal the sick, protect the environment, bring dignity to work, and give space for the joy of self-expression. And as we explore all that, we will indeed foster the emergence of the global leadership needed for the 21st century. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Gildin, thank you very much for what I would say was uh, a definition of poetry in prose, what you just presented. Um, and thank you also for the, uh, the juxtaposition of the young, uh, yes. the physically young and the young, young at heart. Yes, young at heart. Yes, young <laughs> Everything was fine until you got to the hair part. <laughs> I don't even have white hair. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, our next panelist and speaker is Ambassador Amanda Ellis. She's Executive Director of the um, East-West Center in Honolulu and Director of Strategic Partnerships for the um, Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. She's a recognized expert in uh, international development and economics, international relations, diplomacy, uh, sustainability, and many, many more areas. However, notably, she was permanent representative of, the, of New Zealand to the United Nations Office of Geneva and other international organizations. And as such, uh, she, uh, and I can, I'm saying this from my experience, I've spent almost 20 years in Geneva, there are few ambassadors of her uh, worldview, understanding, energy, commitment, not only to uh, promoting her own country, which is one of the uh, more, um, I, I don't want to denigrate others, but it's, it's much more r responsible as a member state. It pays its golf club dues and it does much, much more um, for the uh, organization which it owns. But Amanda was uh, one of the leaders of this diplomatic community, um, and uh, she is still remembered very, very, uh, uh, very warmly by, by those uh, of us who are dinosaurs around here. It wasn't that long ago, but still, uh, diplomats change very quickly. Um, and... Uh, the only problem is that she has uh, decided to apply her enormous talent and uh, an experience in a place which is probably the farthest away from Geneva. If you go any further, you will start coming closer to Geneva. So, uh, Amanda, with that, uh, it's wonderful to see you again. Uh, and uh, please, uh, you have the floor and the screen and the mic. Thank you, David. Wonderful to see you, too. And aloha and good morning, everybody from Hawaii. It's wonderful to be with so many committed catalysts for change. And I wanted to thank Gary Jacobs and his talented team for this extraordinary project. Jonathan finished the last session with the Tamil word for love. And aloha means both love and compassion. It's the greeting everybody uses in Hawaii for both hello and farewell. And I think it's the perfect value that we need for truly transformative global leadership. Oh, well, I hope you can now see this yes. beautiful vision of an interconnected globe, which is really what inspired the wonderful woman who works with me to create this, this interconnected world. We all know the current context, which is distressing to say the least, with the pandemic, growing inequality, racial injustice, police brutality, the climate crisis, I could go on. It's been covered brilliantly throughout the past five days. But as WHO lead Tedros said at the beginning of the conference, hell is a political choice. And as a proud New Zealander, as David referenced, I wanted to highlight the difference in female leadership that we've seen through this pandemic. And I think our young Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who is one of only 7% of women to lead countries, encapsulated it beautifully when she said, be kind and unite against COVID-19. And I think 
that really sums up what we need to do in terms of our values. And Gabriella mentioned empathy, and I, yes, I agree. So compassion and empathy. But when we look at what was it that really led a successful battle against COVID in New Zealand? First of all, consultation and listening to the scientists as youth leader Greta Thunberg counsels we adults. Communication that's clear and consistent, compassion and empathy, and cooperation. Prime Minister often refer, referred to our New Zealand team of five million. Interestingly, when we compare this style of female leadership to the more autocratic, authoritarian male model that is gaining prevalence globally, we see that there could have been six times less deaths had that same model been followed. So I would like to posit that women are a very important part of this transformative leadership. And we need to remember that only eight countries actually have legislative gender equality, despite the commitments of the, the Declaration of Human Rights and of course the recommitment made through the Sustainable Development Goals. So there's a whole raft of new leaders that I want us to think about. And I'm going to whiz through youth, indigenous peoples, local jurisdictions, entrepreneurs and business, and academia. And I think all of those are the models that we want to be emulating. Now, there's two things that I wanted to raise about COVID and climate. COVID has really, really shown us how interconnected we all are. And that has been well covered this week. And this model of the Planetary Boundaries Framework by Johan Rockström, who co-chairs the Earth League with my boss, Peter Schlosser, uh, at the Global Futures Laboratory, really shows us how important it is to understand this notion of interconnectedness and exponentiality, just how quickly there can be a tipping point. And we know that those things hold true for both COVID and for climate. So what are the strategies that we need? This conference has focused very much on transdisciplinary catalysts and silos to systems thinking. And that's exactly where we need to move for these kinds of complex problems. Now, of course, we do need the right kinds of policy frameworks. In 2015, when we were all negotiating Paris, at the same time, more than $5 trillion was being spent on fossil fuel subsidies. As an economist, I get obsessed with the numbers, but this is just crazy. So we need to align both frameworks and incentives. And we know we need the right kind of technologies. They're largely there. And we need business and consumer action at scale. So I'm going to give three examples of the solutions that have really warmed my heart over the past couple of years. So I arrived in Hawaii in 2016 uh, off the Security Council and having co-chaired humanitarian access into Syria, which has to be the most depressing job of my life. And I arrived in Hawaii to find that the UN SDGs had been, been embraced locally as part of a multi-stakeholder coalition. The governor, the four mayors, all of the leaders in business and all of the leaders in civil society had come together to create the Aloha Plus UN SDGs. So for me, this was so uplifting. And to see that Hawaii was the first state when the US president announced the intention to withdraw from the Paris Accords to recommit. Since then, 23 other states have recommitted. So even if there is a failure of governance at the global level, and in many cases, a lack of commitment at the national level, it is very exciting to see that that trend is being bucked at the local level. Another wonderful example, Hawaii was the first state in the US to commit to 100% renewable energy by 2045. And now there are 100 million Americans, almost a third of the population, covered by similar commitments at state and city level. Moving to the Malama mandate, Malama is another beautiful Hawaiian word, which means care. 
and stewardship. And this idea of caring for the planet inspired a worldwide voyage by the Polynesian Voyaging Society, navigating by 13th century techniques, the stars and the wind, successfully around the planet to meet with indigenous peoples and others to really impress upon them the importance of caring for our earth and the, the fact that we will not survive without the planet, the planet will survive without us. So the second wonderful set of solutions, women entrepreneurs. The UN SDG challenge was launched by the Secretary General, the President of the World Bank, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, in 2018 at UNGA. And I am honored to be one of the co-chairs. Three examples from Peru, this notion of regenerative agriculture that Chantal Lean spoke about in the previous session, the aim to connect 5 million indigenous farmers to global supply chains that are ethical and fair trade, as well as regenerative. In Rwanda, a 25-year-old water engineer, so concerned with the 200 million hours that women waste in Africa going in search of water every year and determined to come up with better solutions for the 400 Africans who do not yet have access to water has created Water Access Uganda, employing youth who are disadvantaged and training them to give them green jobs. And from Israel, E-Concrete. Concrete is responsible for around six to eight percent of global emissions and we know that 70 percent of marine infrastructure is concrete we also know that with rising sea levels we are going to have to buttress our coastlines and this is a wonderful example of concrete which is actually biologically uh, attractive to create marine ecosystems and is a carbon sink finally academia and I am so inspired to be working with philanthropist Julie Wrigley at ASU, at the Global Futures Laboratory and the Global Institute of Sustainability. This is an incredible new vision for the planet. So here we have the ability to diagnose through spatial artificial intelligence and remote sensing to help save our coral reefs and to help map invasive species, to actually find solutions through these techniques. Second, the ability to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. And I invite all of you to come to the campus at ASU in Phoenix, and you will actually see mechanical trees that are drawing down CO2. And finally, a wonderful online solar-powered library, which has been designed by a brilliant engineering uh, professor, Laura Hossman. There's now a global partnership with civil society organization, the Peace Corps. And this is enabling all of those communities around a billion people who still have no access to the internet to be connected with curated material that allows them an education. So we might think about that for the next phase of the project, Gary and David. So finally, how do we shape tomorrow today? We know that our planet is under increasing distress and we know that our future is inextricably intertwined with the health of the planet. So th there was a beautiful saying uh, that was in the previous session, both Maria Espinosa and Rama Mani, when they said, we need to be in unity with all of life. So I'm very proud that ASU is number one in the US for innovation, ahead of Stanford and MIT for the last five years, and also number one in the US for the SDG impact ranking and number five globally. So I want to issue an invitation to collaborate with all of these incredible groups who have not yet had their voices fully heard, but are actually sustainability solutionaries. So for transformative global leadership, I'm looking forward to working with you, David, Gary, Donato, and the team to see how we can really take to heart Gabriella's point about skills and training and take that global. Thank you all and aloha.
Aloha, dear Amanda. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, you did do the PowerPoint presentation. It uh, really brought this uh, very substantive uh, feeling of uh, feeling uh, into the, uh, the theoretical discussions that we had, and we sort of visually saw what is being done and what needs to be done and where we should be working together. And uh, I, for one, and I'm sure Gary and uh, Donato and the entire team uh, are looking forward to that. Um, if there ever was a um, uh, the correct sort of moment to say, um, last but not least, this is it, uh, with Gary Jacobs uh, being our uh, last panelist uh, or speaker at this uh, closing session. Uh, we could also think of the French version, pour la bonne bouche. Um, but uh, Gary also has the, as the father of this project, basically, um, uh, together uh, with many other projects, uh, he is a father of many intellectual um, directions, projects, and a, an expert in, in many, many areas. Um, uh, Gary has the unenviable task of doing a first preliminary kind of a wash up of what has been said in these five days. Um, so uh, I would uh, uh, request indulgence from the other panelists to maybe give them a couple of extra minutes to do that, given the, uh, the enormity of the task that he's facing. And uh, it's incredibly important because this will uh, set the stage and bring us uh, directly into uh, into uh, onto the road to the main event, which will be in October of this year. And I will say a little more about that afterwards. Gary, please. I'd like to start off by just commenting that uh, Amanda has done exactly what we want to do and plan to do uh, as we go forward from this, is to take the concepts, the values, the principles that we've been discussing and translate that into catalytic strategies, which is exactly what she's doing at ASU. Uh, and we've heard other very inspiring examples, but this is where we want to go. The motto of the World Academy is leadership and thought that leads to action. We've had a lot of thought, clear, wonderful and thought, uh, and now the rest of this project is how do we move from the thought to the action and what are the stages for that? This conference has been really a meeting of humanity. It's not exclusively of, a, of either a political group or an academic uh, group intellectuals. It's of we the people. It's a partnership and a collaboration with the, the United Nations office in Geneva for whom we're so grateful for their partnership and collaboration. The World Academy, WHO, UNCTAD, UNESCO, UNITAR, ITC, the UN Task Force on Human Security, the Interparliamentary Union, uh, Nizami Ganjabi International Center, ASU, World University Consortium, IEEE, I can't remember or list them all, uh, the Levant Institute, ISICO, Congo, Global Institute, uh, the parliamentarians, the parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, Wango, Club of Rome, excuse me, uh, for all those, otherwise I'd be here all night uh, if I covered everybody who deserves it, uh, and a host of others. We've had about 225 speakers representing countries all over the, from all the continents and people of all ages, at least from under 18 to over 90, our former president of the World Academy, uh, Edgar Guglielmo de Souza, who's I think 93 now, was actively engaged in the, uh, in the uh, we're still truly far from being representative as a group we failed dismally in one in gender. We only had 40% women, uh, which I must admit is a record for the academy, but I would like to see it 60%. And then we could be say we're doing something meaningful. And it, uh, this is not a 
uh, a statement just uh, to be politically correct. I've really seen the impact of the gender equality on the quality of the thinking and the dynamics of the organization. That's really true. Uh, and we need much more of it than we've had in the past. Uh, we're going in the right direction. And we've had over 360 other participants who have come in for different sessions at different times during the week. I think the speakers up until now have done such a good job of presenting the situation we're in that it's, I don't want to spend time on it. This is an unprecedented moment in history. It is a planetary moment. Uh, we've, we, that something is bringing us together, something that appears on the surface to be uh, an enormous calamity, not just because of its impact on human health and life, uh, but on incomes, employment, mm -hmm. economy, uh, households, social stability, the political system, the move to authoritarianism, populism, uh, the acrimony within countries and between countries, which we haven't seen for uh, decades. They retreat from multilateralism and back to competitive nationalism. Old ideas being brought out of the closet and floated again as if they're the answer to anything when we've spent decades trying to escape from them because we know they don't work. Uh, undermining trust and confidence uh, loss of confidence in our leaders, our institutions, our policies, our media, our governments, even in science and technology, uh, and overall human insecurity that we haven't felt perhaps since the Second World War. Uh, and yet it's ironic that over and over again during this five days, speakers have come forward from all different persuasions saying, this is a great opportunity not as a slogan, but as a, with a real conviction that the pressure we're under has created an awareness. It has released an energy. It's released, it's generated a seriousness, an opening of minds and a possibility of change that we really haven't seen for decades. And of course, our challenge now is to convert this planetary moment into planetary momentum to really do something with it. And we know that's not easy. We know that this is, we, we've seen in the past, we've lived through the, 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 the dramatic changes and miracles of 1990, when the end of the Cold War, which opened up so many possibilities and did achieve so much, but also left us longing and disappointed we could have done so much more. We really could have gotten rid of these nuclear weapons instead of waiting 30 years to start building them again. Uh, we could have really ended the animosities and built a global cooperative security system, but we didn't. Uh, uh, we see we've missed so many opportunities in the past. And the question is, can we do better this time? Several of the speakers have referred, I think Ishmael in this session, to the global leadership vacuum, the loss of trust in so many ways. And how are we gonna fill that? Gabriella has spoken eloquently about the qualities of a great individual leader. And we know we need inspired individual leaders to take us forward, not just at the heads of countries and international organizations, we need them in every field. We need them in business, in civil society, in academia, in science. We need them in thought as well as in action. We need them in everything. And yet we also know that individuals alone are not enough. Inspired individuals are themselves the product of a society that's awakened and ready. It's always been a, a mystery to me for a long time. How is it that at great moments in history, when we look back at them, we see there was a, a sudden appearance of an extraordinary group of leaders. At the founding of the United States, we had so many at one time. Uh, at the, during World War II, at the founding of the UN, 
at that period, we had such ex extraordinary, re and yet in between, we go through long periods where uh, we seem to be lacking. Uh, at the founding of Indian independence, uh, uh, extraordinary uh, examples like that, and many others in, 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 in South Africa and other places. But why is it that we don't see it always? Why is it that they come and go? And I think the part of the answer to that is because extraordinary leaders emerge when the society is ready, awakened for them. They don't, they're not unique individuals who are independent of the society. They express, they give expression to the aspirations, the awakening uh, realizations uh, and are able to release and direct the energies to take it forward. So the leader for the, the leader as an individual is part of something wider. Leadership is not just a question of individuals, it's a process. It's a process by which we move forward. We've been moving forward, humanity's been evolving over thousands of years by a very slow evolutionary process, not just physically, but socially and intellectually and technologically, uh, with a lot of trial and error, backwards and forwards, zigzag, dead ends and so forth, to bring us to this point. And in the recent decades, that evolution or that social change has been happening with increasing rapidity. And it's interesting because when we talk about moving forward rapidly, a lot of people, thoughtful people who have observed say, let's not be in too much of a hurry uh, because we can also rush in the wrong direction if we're not clear about where we're going. But the intensity of the moment compels us to do something. It compels us to act, not out of a sense of hurry, but out of the urgency of the moment that things are going in the wrong direction in so many respects. Can we afford to undo uh, so many decades of democracy, so many decades of the institution of a free press, uh, so many decades of trying to bring and build multilateral organizations and say, well, we don't want to be in a hurry, we'll let it just take its time. The, the inspiration or the, the aspiration, I would say, behind this project has been uh, that what we need to do is transform this long, slow process of social evolution into a more rapid, conscious process of social transformation. We need to go faster, but we need to do it with knowledge, with thoughtfulness, with care, and most importantly, with values. And what we've been trying to emphasize and discuss, had wonderful discussions in this conference has been about what is the process? How do we transform ourselves? No species has ever transformed itself. We're the only species that really evolves, culturally evolves, socially evolved, technologically evolved. We evolve in our knowledge. But how do we convert that long, slow process into a conscious process. What can we learn about it from the past? Well, speaking about social transformation sounds a little utopian, uh, and uh, we beware of the utopias. Uh, but it's not something new. We have seen it. We've seen it at the end of World War II when the UN was founded. Uh, uh, reading the history recently is really fascinating because nobody or Nobody who founded the UN expected that within 15 years that the colonial empires of the world would simply dissolve and disappear. That instead of 55 or 60 members, that in a few decades we would have 100 or 150 or 193, it was never there in the thought. Nobody took seriously, I think, or very few people took seriously that when the UN Declaration of Human Rights was framed uh, with taking great care that there's no power for enforcement, there's no, legally, uh, no legal obligation on the nations that signed it to actually enforce it, that it would gradually and progressively acquire the force of law. The force of law to the extent that to go against the basic principles could be considered a crime against humanity, punishable crime against humanity. And finally, 
as Jeffrey Sachs mentioned a few days ago in one of the sessions, uh, what we have today as the SDGs is really the incarnation of the UN Declaration of Human Rights taken from lofty idealistic principle to practical goals and physical quantifiable targets to going forward. We've seen, a, we did see a, a dramatic transformation at the end of the Cold War. It's not all that we wanted, but it certainly changed the world for the better in many, many respects. It led to the unification of Europe after centuries and centuries of warfare. It led to the birth of the internet as the first global social institution. So I don't think we need to feel, and I don't feel that we're being utopian in talking about transformation. But we also have to understand that there's so much we need to learn about this process. We do need to learn more. And it's clear, I think it's clear to all of us in our discussions that this transformation or evolution or new paradigm or whatever we want to call it is not going to happen because we managed to get a, mir a miracle of the, uh, the perfect idealistic leaders that we need from 193 countries or even from 13 countries uh, at one time. This is not a transformation that's gonna be done by a few political leaders, though we would welcome and need the help of everyone that we can get. It's gonna be done by humanity. It's going to be done by the society that demands a change. And maybe that's one of the reasons why COVID is generating so much optimism as that which Doug Roach expressed uh, in his remarks in the last session and many others as well, because we see that awakening. We see the youth, the Greta Thunbergs and so many others, the, the POP movement who have been so active in our conference and, and, and so many others. We see the awareness is there, that the aspiration for action is there, that the expectation that we will change and the commitment to change will be there. It's, it's not just a top-down movement, it is a grassroots upward movement as well. And the leadership we need is not just with political leaders, not just with political institutions, as important as they are, certainly by the, with the multilateral institutions, but we need it from our universities to come out. And I'm proud that we heard so many of them saying, we've got to make our universities relevant to what's going on in the society, not just as uh, reservoirs of knowledge of the past, but teaching us and thinking about the future. We've got to reorient ourselves. Universities have a, a great institution, one of the greatest of human institutions over millennium it's developed and helped us evolve but we were going so slowly then. We still are looking so much at the past. We need to be looking forward and understanding the future and the changes that are taking place, like the ones that Amanda showed us with the planetary limits and all. We need that knowledge that projects forward and not just collects artifacts from the past, as important as that is. Our, our academies, which for so long have lived in a somewhat isolation from uh, the, uh, the, the pressures of day-to-day -day life. We need our academies to come together. We had a wonderful session by the Inter-Academy Paddle with 140 academies from around the world, which are out there actually fighting on how do we save the forests or how do we, uh, we, we have the networks of universities around the world that are working on the SDGs like the Black Sea uh, uh, group, which was there with us in Baku at NGIC uh, last year, who are working on uh, how do we uh, address the climate issues, how do we address uh, the environmental issues. We need leadership in all of these areas. We need leadership in business. We, need, we had a wonderful session this morning, uh, one I was most looking forward to, of leading uh, uh, financial analysts, uh, uh, fund managers, uh, of the different descriptions from around the world who are talking about how finance has to be transformed, how we need a financial system that doesn't just act for itself, but really supports the real economy, really supports the implementation of the SDGs, really builds a sustainable future. And for those of you who haven't heard it, I would urge you to, uh, 
to listen to the, the videos which are available on the website or will be very shortly uh, because they were very optimistic about the, the need for change, the, actually the inevitability of change, that the, the old financial system that we've been living with is already gone. And about nine months ago, we had a meeting with the UN in New York with our friend Lawrence Ford and Kitran Patel uh, of a group called the Future Capital uh, Initiative. And the day before, four of the members, there were about 70 of us there, four of those members were in a meeting, a private meeting with billionaires led by Michael Bloomberg, in which he said in that closed office, let's be clear, capitalism as we know it is dead. It has no future. It can only destroy itself unless we change it. And that's the reason why 200 companies came forward last year and said uh, the idea of shareholder value as the, the iron law for business is simply out of business. We've got to stay, talk about stakeholder capitalism. We've got to talk about companies that serve humanity and not just serve their shareholders. It doesn't take genius to know that that's, that that's what a business is for, but it's taken decades for a business community to feel the pressure to actually say that and think that and tell that to their shareholders and tell that to their managers and tell that uh, to the investment community. So something's going on. And the question before us is, how do we build on that? How do we release that momentum? How do we create that greater awareness? How do we mobilize and organize those energies, not as one single group, but as networks of, of intellectuals, of academies, of universities, of business communities, of youth in all, of all descriptions, of those in working on disarmament and the environment and in every other area. And how do we build the momentum to the point where we can really make a difference? And those of you who have participated in this conference just by participating and sharing your thoughts have really helped us tremendously in taking a step. And those of you who will join us, and, uh, and, all, and we have tried to say this is a platform we're trying to create. This is not something the World Academy or the UN is claiming to do. We're, uh, we're calling to those who are like-minded from uh, different organizations in different fields in different parts of the world and different levels of the society let's join forward. We've already seen, I've seen in the last five days, tremendous ideas, tremendous practical strategies, which I'm not even getting into about finance. I thought the biggest controversy will be how do we finance the SDGs at $7 trillion a year, or, and now some are saying 11 trillion. And we've had three or four very practical uh, proposals from people in the finance industry who say this can be done. And we heard it in the last session, money is not the thing in short supply today. We've got $360 trillion in global financial assets. What we need are the right strategies, the right ideas, and the right values. And I end with that, that to me, the, most, the reason I was so pleased to have as our last session on human security, human security is a kind of a, a catch-all for the, for the SDGs in their widest sense. It's, you know, by the way, it's interesting, the finance group this morning said that, you know, you, we need one more SDG. We need an, an SDG 18 for sustainable finance. And this is the finance community saying it. This is not us telling the finance community is, that that's what they need. So, how do we go forward with this? That's the next steps. Uh, and David will tell you something about, right now we have 14 working groups. We have a large number of partners. We want more. We need collaboration. We need the ideas, the strategies, the ideas from as many as possible. We have another five months of preparation to build up for October. And of course, October is not the end of anything, but we hope that we can go a big step beyond the inspiration uh, and the ideas and the values to the practical steps that can be taken. So my last uh, 
word, I would just, I need to thank too many people and we wouldn't have time for it all. Uh, but I have to thank uh, David and uh, uh, Tatiana Valavaya, the Director General of the UN, without whom both of them, nothing would have been possible. My Vice President uh, of the Academy, Donato Kinniger Sigley, who working in partnership with them has been just a, such a tremendous team. All the speakers, all the panels, all our partners, all our, my colleagues at the World Academy, the administrative team of the Academy and Mother Service Society who have been working behind the scenes tirelessly and facelessly to, to make this happen, and all the participants in the organization. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Gary, thank you so much for this tour de force uh, overview of uh, issues and uh, of uh, uh, cooperation and uh, directions for, co for cooperation. Uh, I think we all thank you because no crew is uh, good enough without a terrific foreman. And you have been um, not only president and CEO of WAS, but you are the, the intellectual inspiration and the organizational uh, engine of this um, we are very happy to, uh, we actually realized that we hooked up with the right guys. Um, and, and we look forward to continuing this. Uh, um, we have a lot of work to do together uh, intellectually to pull all these, uh, this richness of uh, all these golden nuggets that are in, in the uh, results of, of these five days to synthesize them, to, uh, to put order to them and on their basis to prepare the, uh, the two day conference that uh, all this is leading up to on the 27th and 28th of October and uh, the epidemiological situation uh, permitting, we uh, certainly hope to host all of you here at UNOG. And uh, I know that some of, some of us have their favorite uh, chamber at the Palais des Nations, which is the uh, the old League of Nations Council chamber, which Amanda knows very well, uh, and uh, so do others. And uh, we will be, it, it's actually already booked for, for our event. So, um, but as you rightly said, Gary, uh, this is not going to be the end of the road. Uh, what I want to say, uh, especially underline, is the fact that uh, what we've been doing here for the last five days <clears throat> and what we go to October with will be uh, marching in step with the uh, global conversation that the Secretary General launched uh, on the 75th anniversary of the United Nations uh, under the, um, the, the heading of uh, the future uh, we want, the United Nations we need. And the uh, results of that conversation are going to be coming to fruition um, and will be uh, synthesized roughly at the same time uh, as ours. So there is uh, a lot of uh, future synergies uh, right there with the UN. So I think it's a, it's a, um, a vindication of, of our partnership here. And, um, and I particularly want to thank the World Academy uh, for, for the incredible amount of partnerships that it has and brings to uh, to our uh, bilateral relationship. That is one of the most uh, valuable um, aspects of, of uh, working with the World Academy. Um, with that, um, I think um, we are well over time. Uh, however, I do have uh, a request from a very special someone who would like to finish uh, this conference, as the French say, for the end of the year, finir en beauté. Uh, so uh, Rama Mani would like to uh, grace these proceedings with yet another beautiful poem. And uh, with that, uh, after she's done, we can all fade away like uh, Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> Rama, over to you, please. Well, David, that is so fitting following your invitation to the UNOG because you were the one having only known me since 1992 as 
an academic and a global governance person with a commission on global governance said, why don't you give a poetry recital in your beloved library? So in that note, I dedicate this as my best way of saying thank you to this extraordinary partnership of UNOG and WAS to the great leadership shown by Gary and Donato and yourself, dear David, uh, and the team. And so this is a tale for transformative leaders from Mother Earth in the age of COVID. Stop came the injunction from above. Tractors and trucks, trains and planes, our countless fuel guzzling cars screeched to a halt and part. Day after day, we all stayed home. Mother Earth looked around in sheer disbelief. Mother Earth heaved a sigh of relief. She cleared her choking lungs, charred with the poison of our fuel and fumes. With monumental effort, she tried to breathe. Wheezing like an old asthmatic soul at first. <gasps> then breath by breath, she regained her poise. Graced gusts of air, she inhaled and exhaled to renew herself and revive us all. First, she visited the aged, the lonely, the poor. She blessed the suffering and the sick with tears of love. She embraced the dead. She visited those countless humans, forgotten and unseen, in war zones, IDP and refugee camps, cramped in slums and hovels, and those homelessly crouched on our city streets. All together, she addressed us, the still living. It's time to restore yourselves and your world. Now, start right now by taking your first step. Breathe. Confused and curious, we wondered what she wanted us to do. Come on, she cajoled. You can do it. Just breathe. So we cleared our encrusted chests and we sniffed the air. It was so fresh and delicious it stung us with sheer surprise. Is this how it was meant to be? Is this why we were meant to breathe? You mean we need not choke and cough all day in smog, industrial waste and urban stench? We began to laugh and dance with joy. We had forgotten what joy felt like. Mother Earth watched us benevolently. Mother Earth smiled. Now, my Earth children, my human children, you can flourish as you now know what really counts for human and planetary security. And so at last, your kith and kin that crawl and fly and hop and swim can stay alive too, to help me keep the earth in balance so you all can live. It's time, my dears, to regenerate nature, each other and yourselves, to live in justice and inclusion as a united earth family, just as it was always meant to be. Good luck, transformative leaders. You're well on your way. Thank you so much, Raman. There's nothing like uh, beautiful poetry and beautiful music to put a logical, uh, intellectual full stop uh, at a conference. And that particular poem about Mother Earth, we thank you and Mother Earth thanks you.